Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's time once again for another one of our curating your movie library segments and that means the blessing of welcoming my precious wife onto the program sweetheart thank you for being here thank you for having me and thank you for watching this movie with me that we're about to talk about Mm. you know uh as we discussed in an earlier segment this week you've been struggling with some health issues uh, that and the fact that they're now available just about everywhere has put us in uh, something of a early Christmas movie jag, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm happy to be in with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but we made an exception this particular night, and you were willing to watch something that uh, I suggested for us uh, that I thought you probably weren't real aware of a lot about it. I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was going to be really interesting, and it turned out to be so. Thank you. The movie we're talking about is called The Trial of the Chicago 7. It uh, is on Netflix. It was written by Aaron Sorkin, who is an incredibly well-respected Hollywood writer. Uh, He's the uh, creator of The West Wing, which I've never actually seen, Mm -hmm. but he's written other movies that have done really very well, that are, again, very well written, and this was another one. And it tells the story, as far as we know. We don't, you know, it doesn't, it's based on a true story. I don't know whether the there were biases or anything. Uh, and that's going to come up in, as we continue to talk about it. But it tells the, broadly speaking, the story of uh, what happened in Chicago in 1968. Chicago was hosting the Democratic National Convention. Uh, the sitting president at that time was Lyndon Baines Johnson, but he had determined not to run again. Uh, Robert Kennedy had been the front runner earlier, but he'd already been assassinated uh, at that point. And eventually it ended up that Hubert Humphrey uh, received the nomination but lost the election to Richard Nixon. Well, because of the ongoing war in Vietnam and because Johnson had supported it as the president from the Democratic Party, uh, there were uh, uh, plans made to protest the war to disrupt the events uh, among a series of radical left-wing groups um, amongst whom would be the Black Panthers, Mm -hmm. Students for Democratic Society, the Yippies, uh, and several other groups. And things did get ugly, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very, very ugly in real life. And and what was interesting, I don't remember, remember this about it, but they would sort of splice together uh, movie footage of these riots with news footage of the riots. It It would go from color to black and white to Mm -hmm. color to black and white. Uh, But the focus is not on the riots themselves, but on the trial uh, of the people who were put in leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where the issue of of, uh, bias comes in. Mm I, I can certainly believe that the basic telling of the story is absolutely accurate. But this is not a those horrible, wild, crazy Democrats movie. You see a lot of shady, shady goings on. Mm-hmm. In fact, the whole thing is basically uh, uh, framed as uh, This trial is a way for John Mitchell, the Republican under Nixon attorney general, uh, to punish and pay back Ramsey Clark, Lyndon Baines Johnson's attorney general, who had slighted Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And so this was an attempt uh, to embarrass him. By the way, Ramsey Clark is played by uh, the inimitable... Uh, Michael Keaton, born and raised in Pittsburgh, (laughs) a true Yinzer. Uh, So, uh, you know, I found like, I I felt like it was one of those movies that just did an outstanding job of 
informing you historically. Mm -hmm. You know, I I had taken a class in college on the 60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had an an elective left over at the end of, even though I had two majors, I had an elective left over my last semester, and there was a professor that I wanted to take that I'd never had before who was a history professor, and he was teaching class in the 60s, and I'm like, this is perfect. Um, For those of you who've been faithful listeners over the years, or over the months anyway of this podcast, you may remember me doing a hero you never heard of about Kathy Van Til, who taught my freshman English slash humanities class. This was her husband, John Van Til, who Mm. taught this class in the 60s. So I knew about the Students for Democratic Society. I knew the distinctions among these groups, what they had in common. But I felt like I was really getting an education uh, about what happened while at the same time enjoying a movie Mm -hmm. like if it was just a story if it had never happened i would have enjoyed the movie enormously Mm -hmm. uh so that you know there are some based on real life stories that sort of veer too far away from the story others that stay so close to the story that they're not really conducive to being a good movie this was both what's going to happen what's good and the characters Mm -hmm. i mean the, the larger than life characters coming together in one place uh, Frank Langella plays the uh, uh, presiding judge who is probably the biggest villain of the whole movie. Uh, but you watch and you wait and you wonder what's going to happen. You see the tension among the different leadership groups and their different perspectives. It's, it's uh, I don't know, I just, I found it compelling. Was there something that... that you enjoyed about it that I haven't mentioned. Well, I think while these men were on trial and they put up um, Sacha Baron Cohen, who played Abby Hoffman, mm-hmm. and he was getting cross examined. And the cross examining attorney just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And, and Abby just profoundly said, I didn't know my thoughts were on trial because oh, they were yeah. trying to convict him by what he thought about something. Yes. And you could just see how all this tape would just getting peeled back from the corruption that was going on. It was uh, very powerful. It was. Well, and then there's the, the, the tension inside the defendants about how to, whether to try to be mature and grown up and to fight this, whether to be more uh, dramatic and treat it like sort of prophetic theater. And at the end, the one guy who was always pushing for the mature response uh, is given the opportunity to give the closing argument. And what he chooses to do in his closing argument is simply read the names of all the soldiers that mm-hmm. had died in Vietnam since the trial had started. Mm-hmm. And the judge was just out of control. Yes. Drove him berserk. There was so much abuse in that uh, courtroom. Yes. That those attorneys watched that the bailiffs went and beat Bobby Seale from the uh, Black Panthers, yes. thinking, this is in our court system. Yes. In our American court system. It's heart-wrenching. It is. Uh, but it's a great movie to watch. It's We're out of time, so I want to encourage people to check it out. If you got Netflix, uh, The Trial of the Chicago 7, uh, really good. And again, let me remind you, we would love to hear from you to get your thoughts on the matter. Uh, maybe you know more about it than I do and can tell me if there was some bias that sort of slanted things. Uh, or maybe it was worse than it seemed. I don't know. But thank you guys uh, for tuning in. Thank you, sweetheart, thank you for, having me. for being at the movies with me. I love it. I love it, and I love you, baby. I love you too, honey. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Pride is our besetting sin inside the church outside the church in the 21st century in the 20th century and every century before that one of the ways that that pride is manifested in our day is in our smug sense of superiority over those who went before us we have this idea that our forefathers were helplessly superstitious rubes and we're so much more sophisticated than than they were. Hmm. Are we really? Have we set aside the power of superstition in our modern age? Have we become so scientifically minded 
that we no longer have to wrestle with irrational fears. Well, before you pat yourself on the back for being a 21st century modern thinker, I'd like you to do this. The next time you're in the big city, the next time you need to stay overnight in the big city and, you, and you're going to stay at a high-rise hotel, ask them for a room on the 13th floor. Well, don't tell me they don't have a 13th floor. They do have a 13th floor. If there are 13 or more floors in the building, they have 13 floors or more in the building, which means they have a 13th floor. But if you step into the elevator and you look for the f button for the 13th floor, there's a button for the first floor, the second floor, third floor, all the floors except for the 13th floor. How do you get off on the 13th floor? Oh, if you press the 14, it will actually take you to the 13th floor. But it's easy to get confused because when you get off on the 13th floor, having pushed that 14 button, you're going to notice that all the rooms have 14s on them. You're going to think, wait a minute, RC, it didn't work. It took me to the 14th floor. No, it didn't. It took you to the 13th floor. If you want to go to the 14th floor, you got to go up one more, press the 15. And when you get there, all the doors will have 15s on them. How weird is that? How bizarre is that? And yet it's true. Now, I mention this because today, as you listen, it's Friday the 13th. Which means what exactly? This is one of those things where we don't even know why. I mean, we don't know where this started. It reminds me of that story where the husband comes home and his wife is working on dinner and she, she takes the ham and she cuts two inches off of the side of it before she puts it in the oven. And her husband says, well, honey, every time we have ham, I watch you do that. I've never understood it. Why in the world do you cut that two inches off the side of the ham before you put it in the oven? She says, you know, I, never, I don't know. It's just the way I learned to do it. It's the way my mother did it. He says, go ahead and call your mom. Ask her why she does it. So she calls the mom. Mom, you know how we cut the two inches off the ham before we put it in the oven? Why do we do that? And the mom says, I don't know. Never thought of it. That's the way your grandmother taught me to do it. So they call the grandmother. Grandma, why did, why do you cut the two inches off the ham before you put it in the oven? Help me understand. Grandmother said, well, that's easy. If I didn't cut the two inches off the ham, it wouldn't fit. So grandma has a small oven and 60 years later, her daughter and granddaughter are acting as if they have small ovens when they don't. That's superstition. That's doing things that we don't know why. And we have no idea. I mean, I'm, I'm sure if I Googled it, I could find some sense of history about why Friday the 13th is supposedly unlucky. Even that. We talk about luck. I mean, you <laughs> take a drive, go on the interstate. It will not take you long to find a car with crystals hanging from its rearview mirror. With dream catchers. All the kind of superstitious nonsense that's common in our day. It's not going to go away. Because at the end of the day, all superstition is, is the foolish belief that we should fear the universe and that if we have the right kind of knowledge and the right kind of tools, we can manipulate it. You know what it is? It's witchcraft. It's 
precious little difference between carrying around a rabbit's foot for good luck and playing with a Ouija board. We are not sophisticated moderns. We're prideful pre-moderns on Friday the 13th and every day. We're told in 1 Samuel 15, verse 35, that God regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. This particular text, friends, is just one of several in the Bible wherein we see God describing his own regret or remorse, where we see God appear to change his mind. In other portions of Scripture, see, for instance, Numbers 23, 19, God affirms what seems much more plausible to us, that because God is God, he never regrets, repents, or changes his mind. To understand how this can be, we must do our best to come to grips with the different ways that God interacts with his creation. Consider the calling of Daniel in light of the invasion of the Babylonian army. We know God sent that army to punish Judah. But we have to affirm that Daniel did well to fight against them. Why would God call Daniel to fight an enemy God himself sent? Well, here we run into the important distinction between God's prescriptive or revealed will and his decretive or hidden will. The former refers to his law, what he commands of us. The latter refers to his sovereign efficacious will, by which he brings all things to pass. God's law, for instance, forbids bearing a false witness. Yet, in Peter's sermon at Pentecost, he affirms that God had determined from before all time that Jesus would be unjustly delivered to the Roman authorities, which plan included false witness. We have a similar situation here. Understand that history is God's story. God is the author of all of history, and, touching on his sovereignty, brings all things to pass. His decretive will is always done. But just as Shakespeare not only wrote his plays, but acted in them, so God is an actor in his own story. God, for instance, decreed before all time that he would give me new life, a new heart, the gift of faith. But God, the actor in space and time, actually did this. With respect to Saul and the flood and other instances where God is described as having changed his mind, we have God, the author, deciding that God, the actor, would change course. Look at it this way. God, the author of history, knew from before all time that Saul would fail. He knew from before all time that he would reject the kingship of Saul. And he knew that he would, as an actor in the story, first choose Saul, and then later, again as an actor, reject Saul. God the actor changed direction as God the writer had determined from before all time. Of course, the God who writes history and the God who acts in history is one and the same God. We're just looking at the story from different perspectives. We can move forward with confidence that God's promises are always yea and amen. We can trust all that he has told us, 
And we can rejoice that he is not just an aloof writer of the story, but is actively involved in the story, in our stories, and in our lives each and every day. The God we worship is sovereign over all things, and he acts in space and in time. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.